So every once in a while I'll get uh, flack for letting a Christmas song uh, peek in there, you know. Everyone, some people don't enjoy that. They say, no, that's supposed to happen at Christmas. But as I spoke about the light going out into the world, that's what I, I wanted that, that sense of understanding to come forth and come yet again. And also to proclaim once again that Jesus is Lord, that he is the prophet that is high and mighty. We read the scripture here, though, that he was back in his hometown and he went there and no one would believe him. In his hometown, no one would believe him. They even drove him to a cliff to toss him off the cliff. All right? But he passed through them and went away safely. I want to read a scripture about another prophet. It was Jeremiah. This is many, many years before Jesus. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put his hands and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words into your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Well, good morning to you on this actually first Sunday of uh, Black History Month. And I, I want to emphasize that because uh, in uh, the passages I spoke about this very issue, this idea of us needing to delve into this more certainly uh, in our community. And why? Well, because, especially because there are so few very uh, black persons who live in our community, it's become, it becomes easy to say, well, we don't need to do that because we don't see those folks. Well, that's the exact reason why we should be more exposed to that. We should talk about that because there is something that keeps that kind of um, mixing to happen in a town like Essex. But before we go there, I would like to read to you something about the first people who ever um, publicly proclaimed that slavery was wrong. It wasn't as if it just happened in the 1800s. It was going on for a long, long, long time before that. So in 1688, I mean, our new nation was, barely, was not even 100 years old, or not even nation, or the people, uh, white folk living in this area, uh, they were barely here. The Quakers in their wisdom and in their peacemaking, they came to have a statement. They saw the slave trade as a grave injustice against their fellow human being, and they used the golden rule to argue against such inhumane treatment, regardless of skin color. They said, we should do unto others as we would have done unto ourselves. And they stated, pray, what thing in the world can be done worse towards us than if others should rob or steal us away and sell us for slaves to strange countries, separating household from their wife and children? So this was in 1688. Now, mind you, I know there are at times we need to be thinking, uh, people will, will suggest, well, things have changed since then, and they certainly have in a wonderful way. But we need to remember that slavery was a part of our country from the mid-1600s to the mid-1800s. So 200 years where people of color, specifically African Americans, we're told that they were not human, basically, who were used and were abused. And then for the next hundred years after that, 
they also suffered great, uh, great problems in being still yet known as human or being segregated. And if you've seen that book, The Green Book, that's one of the movies that's out right now, uh, black folk had, had compiled a book and they passed it around to one another to let them know when they were traveling specifically through the South where they could go to be safe. This was up until not too long ago, folks. So we can see that we simply just can't eradicate the feelings, let alone our feelings about race, but their feelings of race. Being told as a people for 300 years, they are less than, they are not normal. It's important that we, especially as Caucasian folk, take the time to take that in. We've been told forever, seemingly, that we are good, that we are uh, normal, that we are right. It's in our being, right? You just know it and feel it and understand it. But if your people have been told that they are abnormal, that they are, they are wrong, they are, they are not human, that also is in their being. So we need to fight against that. Now I speak to these words because it's important. Because Jesus came to us as a prophet. He came here to do so and to speak words. And as we see in the story today, that they didn't want to listen to him. There are times that people don't want to hear what's right. Now I remember when I was a kid that having to do the right way of something was always the thing that I was supposed to do, being taught. I remember being taught by example by my parents that a shortcut was not going to be tolerated. Nothing could happen like that in our household. Not even, um, it didn't make something right just because you felt the wrong was okay or that no one would see. And I, as a kid, I remember getting frustrated uh, when that ethic made for me missing out uh, on something and how as a kid I just wanted the easy or the fun way out or the way to be accepted. My parents were very ethical people. They are. I say are even though mom has passed on. Dad still is alive, of course. Her spiritual presence is still very close to me. Dad's as well. They guide me in that teaching. It's not that I have always done right in my life. It's not. Nobody is ever perfect. But I have found that not doing things the right way always has a way of catching up to me. Now the anxieties that overshadow congregations all across our land are epidemic. High anxiety has moved churches to do things that in less anxiety-filled times would have been considered unthinkable. Shortcuts, unethical. In order to keep doors open or bodies in pews, there are some congregations that have been selling their parsonages, they fire extra ministers, they reduce pay for their employees, and along the way they stab each other in the back. They, they blame the state or the church, national church settings, and some have become exclusive by loudly proclaiming either a subtle or an outright homophobic or racist teaching in their church. Where there is anxiety, people look inward and risk far less, even when they are a person of privilege even though they have very little, opportun the opportunities hardly exist for them to lose that kind of privilege, they still will bur burrow in deep. Hear from the scripture, the Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations, then I said, ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Friends, churches too often have played the part initially played by Jeremiah. Or for that part, Moses, or Elijah, 
or Jonah, none in that august group felt as if it was their skill or in their belly to prophesy or to lead the nation or even a small town. Leading feels risky and scary. We convince ourselves the job of a prophet belongs to someone else. That we can never live up to the expectations of that role of prophet. Moses, he fled into the wilderness and was chased down by God. Elijah fled to a cave, but was whispered to in his ear, by the voice of God. Jonah escaped in a boat, but he got swallowed up by a great fish, vomited out on the shore, only to have yet another conversation with God, who sent him to Nineveh. When we could be standing out from the crowd, too often we find ourselves trying to be like the other guys, silent and exclusive. The prophets found out that it always catches up to you. Now, I know there has been what seems good reason to keep our mouths shut. We think that if we appear too passionate, others will take offense. Sometimes we think that, they, that we'll look like something that they've seen in a movie or we'll look like overzealous religious people. We hear the stories and we see the evidence in our pews of how fewer people come to church these days, and we're told that there is now a whole generation of people who have never put their foot inside of a church on a Sunday morning. When these people do enter a church, they usually do it for a wedding or for a funeral. And even those two events are happening outside churches at alarmingly increasing rates. The problem lies in the message that has been dominated by negative, loud proclamation that has been supported by us staying silent, not wanting to be as seen, being seen as too pushy. And it's catching up to us, my friends. From Jeremiah again. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. You shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you says the Lord. I would hope, or I would like to hope, that the members of the First Congregational Church in Essex, Essex would no longer stay silent and on their own, by this faithful hearing of this scripture, would no longer be fearful that their words of spirit will be misinterpreted or that they will be shamed. Now Jesus was in a synagogue. He too had heard negative proclamation by the ruling class of the Jewish faith. Like us, he had seen the brutality of the world and of nations. So when he was in the place of sharing, he said, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke, spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. Now, people hear gracious words and are often amazed to hear them. So amazed that people often quickly discount them and they return to the narrative that has fueled their distaste for so long. That's why we need to keep speaking words of grace, words of inclusion, rather than, well, the well-worn narrative that much of the public has heard from churches. Narratives that promote exclusivity and judgment of other people. In the story today, we see Jesus eventually chased out of town by the people who knew him best. When he lets them know that he understands their doubt, that, his, that this doubt will actually make his words of graciousness ring in their mind. They attempt to drive him off the side of a cliff. They become so enraged because he reminded them of their duty. <laughs> they got enraged. Their anxiety fueled a lynching, and yet in the closing sentence, we see that he is protected. You remember that? It said, he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. 
Jesus keeps to his goal, no matter what anyone says, because he has been called by God. As we have been called by God to speak words of inclusion rather than exclusion. And from the scripture, it says, For you shall go to all to whom I send you. You shall speak where, whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Friends, to wrap, I call on all of you to be the prophet. It's now imperative for you to accept the mantle. We will practice inclusion even when others don't want to believe that we do. And if this seems a risky or scary thing, you're right, it is. But it is the right thing to do. Not doing this would be a shortcut. You have opened your doors to include everyone so that we would not be giving power to doubt. But you are now called. I am acting as God's conduit this very moment to call to you that we should not only prophesy, but we should give also the world, right here on our little corner of the world, the gift of leading. And it is something that will feel risky. Most likely, if it feels risky, you're probably on the right track. You've been called. And believe it or not, you've done it yourself. In your ONA statement, it talks about it. So I call upon you to become creative, to become energized and even empowered. Tell me how we should lead. Tell each other how we should lead in making a spectacle of justice. It is important yet to this very day, my friends, to this very day. And I pray that this will be a call to you from which you respond. Amen.